folks. Uh, folks online, can we just do a quick sound check? Everyone, let us know if you can hear us. Great. We'll be starting in just uh, a minute here. Folks are filing in. They're they're in. Miguel Miguel's good. All right. Uh, thank you all for joining us today for the HMSC Research Seminar. Uh, my name is Yi Chung Chung. I'm the Academic Program Manager here at Oregon State University's Hatfield Green Science Center here in Newport, Oregon. Um, and I'll be your host for today's talk. Uh, this is a hybrid event with folks attending both on-site and online. Uh, Sabina is our hybrid support today. Uh, please let her know if you're having any technical issues so she can assist or let those of us on site know. Uh, for those online, we have your mics, cameras, and screen share off, but we please ask uh, any questions you might have using the chat at any time, and we'll answer any questions at the end of the talk. If you put a question in the chat, we'll read it out for everyone. Uh, you're also welcome to raise your digital hand at the end of today's talk. We'll be letting you know when it's your turn and we'll help to unmute your mic. For those of you in the room, uh, if you have not already, please make sure you sign in. And if you haven't signed in, you can sign in on your way out. Um, if, uh, we will be handling questions today uh, at the end of the talk. If you have a question, please raise your hand in here and we'll bring you a mic. We also will have a mic set up in the uh, bottom right corner there. Uh, you must have a, a mic to ask a question so those online can hear. Uh, we'll be recording this event uh, and it will be posted on the HMSC Pass Seminar page in a few days uh, and you can go to our past seminar page on our website. <clears throat> so uh, also a couple of announcements. Uh, please join us next week uh, for our uh, HMSC research seminar uh, hosted by the OSU Marine Mammal Institute on Thursday, July 27th at 3.30 when Dr. Tara Witte, uh, president of the president and conservation research and evaluation consultant of Karina, Karuna Incorporated will share with us coastal conservation research and research training, project evaluation, and integration of design thinking approaches into conservation. Let me introduce you to Dr. Bob Cowan, Director of the Hatfield Marine Science Center and Associate Vice President of Research and Operations here at Hatfield. We'll introduce our speaker today. Thanks, Yi Chung. Well, welcome everyone. It gives me a, a great uh, honor. I will give that to him for a moment. Um, for introducing the speaker today. Uh, Keith and I go back a long ways, uh, graduate students together, did a lot of field work together, so uh, a lot of good memories there. Uh, Keith Miles is the current director of the USGS Western Ecological Research Center. He's been in that role since 2014. Um, I'm gonna take some notes off of here and I will edit what's not really true. Um, <laughs> uh, okay. That uh, no, okay, that's it. <laughs> no, Keith, Keith has got a, a very varied uh, career from 87 to 2013. He was working with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as an ecologist in Laurel, Maryland, and then moved to Davis, where he also transitioned to the USGS 
as an ecologist and had an adjunct professorship with UC Davis, where he led a variety of, of uh, researchers and graduate students uh, on field-oriented research that approaches uh, studying the effects of contaminants in wildlife and how some of those contaminants might be affected by different natural habitats. Then he later transitioned again in his, some of his research directions where he started working with gene transcription to discern effects of xenobiotics on such organisms as sea otters, polar bears, and desert tortoises, a, a natural trio. Um, Keith conducted research in Chesapeake, San Francisco, the California coast, uh, Aleutian Islands and Southwest Desert. And I've had the uh, enjoyment of working with him in the Aleutians and off, off of California, particularly the Channel Islands. He's authored or co-authored over 150 uh, articles and, and uh, federal reports and continues to be active in that role, which I'm, I'm impressed given his um, uh, directorship roles. He's a native of, D of Washington, D.C. He went to Howard University and he is a Beaver. He got his master's and his PhD uh, here in, in wildlife uh, at, at OSU. All of that, and the most important fact is not on a CV. He was Sue's and my best man at the wedding. So, yeah, there you go. Now we can applaud for him. <laughs> okay, I'll hand this over to Keith. Thanks very much, Keith. Okay, is this working? Everyone can hear me. Um, I'm. I have a bunch of notes on my slides. I was. I haven't talked in front of an audience in probably a 10, 15 years. Uh, I moved into management in actually in 2011. I was still doing some work as a PI, but started moving into the management. So moving away from talking to a a uh, audience like this is all kind of new for me. And then getting into COVID, it's even more new. So you have to bear with me. I, I, I'd like to just try not to read notes and just drone on because that's the, that's the bad thing about COVID with PowerPoints and team and everything. You could sit there and give a presentation, just read the whole thing and nobody would know. And they think, wow, this guy knows everything. And you just really are just uh, regurgitating what's on the screen. Uh, the Western Ecological Research Center is a we're, we're a different kind of USGS Science Center in that we don't have a, a main building. This, this facility that, that Bob has been a part of is amazing to have. We're, we're, we're like, a, 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 like gypsies in, in the state of California and with also a group uh, in Nevada, but we are close to where we need to be to do the science. There are major ecosystems in California that are under duress because of primarily because of human uh, encroachment onto those systems. And so we have our people located where they, where they need to be. Our primary function as a research center is to provide science to primarily DOI agencies, National Park Service, US Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, Bureau of Ocean uh, Energy uh, Management, uh, Bureau of Land Management, et cetera. But we work closely, and a, a key word is that collaboration is so key to being a good scientist. We really encourage our scientists to engage with academia, to engage with scientists from these other agencies and work together. One of the hard things of being a new scientist is that your, your tendency is look out for me. You know, I've got, to, I've got to show who I am. But as you get more involved in your science, you're, especially with eco ecosystem ecological science, you start to realize it's for, the, it's for conservation. It's for the species that we are having such an encroachment on as, as, a, as a human species. So we are, I think that marker may be up. I don't know if that red mark will move. Oh, thanks. Okay. Is that good? Okay. So we're located at 11 field stations throughout uh, California with one major station in, in Boulder City, which is just outside of, of Las Vegas. And we're close to these ecosystems, such as the Sierra Nevada uh, uh, and coastal forests, Central Valley wetlands, Great Basins, uh, and on and on, so that we have our people situated and because of 
all of the places that we're situated, we do a, such a variety of science. My job is to help facilitate the scientists that do the work. I don't tell them how to do this science. I do give them some guidelines of what they should be doing because it is for the good of the Department of Interior and the, and the management agencies that, that uh, we, we are to support. So there is some guidance there that I have to keep them in line. But for the most part, we're, we are um, supported by about $6.5 million of federal dollars. Our scientists bring in another 18 to $22 million just in terms of proposal writing um, and designing studies that are of need to DOI partners. So we have four uh, science themes. Probably the biggest one is species recovery because in California, there's over 300 threatened or endangered species. I used to think Hawaii had more. Hawaii has more plant species. California has more species overall. So there's no dearth of work that needs to be done. There's been some challenges to whether our work, whether we should be doing the science of DOI and maybe not Park Service having a bio, biologist doing. There's nothing further from the truth. There is so much work to be done. Collaboration is such a key and we have to be working together and not bumping into each other because there is so much that has to be done. Um, Ecosystem response to human activity. Well, urbanization is gonna be a big, big issue. Uh, the wildland urban interface uh, with the president's push on alternative energy, there's consequences to that alternative energy. Uh, wind energy, solar energy, they, they're, they're great for the environment, but they also have an impact on the environment. So there's a balance that needs to be, be met. We provide the science for the, the resource management to make those decisions about what that balance should be. And then ecosystem processes and long-term research. You're gonna hear me mention this on a couple of occasions because there's no way we can really come to grips with what's really going on in the system just by doing four or five years of work and then changing to something else. And most of our principal investigators, PIs, have been at this for at least 10 or 15 years or more. Even my newest ones had worked with previous pre, uh, principal PIs to get to where they are. And that, that's another key element of doing good research is mentorship, training someone to know what you know, and hopefully they can do better what you did. And then of course, applications for management use. And, and that particular uh, diagram or, or photo up there is actually of a genetic toolbox that one of our PIs created in which you can feed genetic viability data into a, a model and it will spit out, given the habitat, where in, in uh, elements of population dynamics of that species, where are the best places that you can conserve for the species? In this case, I think this is for a horned lizard. So if you looked in Southern California, that red is where you really need to concentrate your efforts because that's where the species is, has the most viability that it, that it won't wind up in a founder's effect. Um, uh, and, and threaten this, this, this continuous existence. And I'll, I'll, um, what I had thought I would do is just go through some of the diversity of studies that, that we're involved in. It would take me over an hour to talk about all 21 of my principal investigators. I'm gonna run through a few and hopefully I can get through them. Um, Adrian Doss was trained by Nate Stevenson who started on Forest Dynamics, Forest Ecology in Sierra, Sierra Nevada, probably 35 years ago. But he, in about 10 years ago, started training Adrian Doss to take over what, what he did. And it's, a, it's so fortunate because things have started happening in the Sierras that are unprecedented. The drought conditions, the wildfire conditions that are happening, we haven't seen before. We saw so much die off of sequoias in the past couple of years that has never happened in the history, in the 200 years of history that we have recorded history of sequoias. And the, the threat is so dire that it's, there's no sign based on climate models that, that it's gonna improve. So what have they been able to do? They've had such a data set, they know where, where populations of sequoias occur that actually are at lower elevations and higher temperatures. 
now what they what they have proposed is let's start transplanting some of those seedlings begin a gradual in, uh, move up in elevation and hopefully these these species we got to wait a thousand years sometimes to see what happens but hopefully we're giving them enough of a boost that they'll be able to survive and we won't lose the sequoias at these higher elevations um, when the temperatures rise to a point that it affects their ability to reproduce. And that's the crazy thing is sequoias need wildfire in order to survive. But we're getting into situations now that the fires are more intense, they're more frequent, and we're getting not, a lot more um, uh, weedy vegetation that's feeding that, that cycle. So we have to be proactive. We provided National Park Service with this guidelines whether they act on it, or they, they are going to act on it, but it's being challenged because some people say you just shouldn't do anything. Karen Thorne was, is one of my newest ecologists. She, but she's been at this now for about 12 years. And her work has looked at, I think it's eight, yeah, 18 estuaries uh, from Canada to Mexico. And she's been in, uh, examining sea level rise under different climate scenarios and determining that by 2050 or by the next century, we're going to lose a lot of what wetlands we have. And we had lost 90% in the 1800s due to development. So we were down to a small percentage anyway. By 2050 and 20, 2100, we're going to lose most of what we have because there's no place for the wetlands to go. On the West Coast, things, the, the topography changes almost abruptly. So what she has proposed, and she worked on this at the, at the, the Naval Weapons in Seal Beach, California, they have actually been pumping in sediment onto their wetlands to maintain, uh, to try to maintain elevation. And she's also providing this, this information to multiple national wildlife refuges along the coast, tribal NOAA uh, facilities, to, to start trying to figure out ways in which we can combat sea level rise and maintain some semblance of the, of the uh, ecosystem as it is now. Mike Kazaza is, is one of my uh, scientists has been around for about 25, 30. He's actually started out as a technician like me. He uh, was mentored by Mike Miller. He actually was one of the first people to start uh, planning satellite trackers on birds. And what he, from, from that early beginning to now, he has developed a system in which in real time, he, he's marking birds, academia is marking birds, other governments are marking, marking birds all over the world. He's able to pull in that data real time and show where birds are moving and how they're adjusting to habitat change. He had a paper last year that actually showed that birds were moving around the fires. That in their migration, they're, they're, let's see, they're north to south, no, south to north, north to south uh, during the fires in the late late uh, summer, and and has now shown that even fires now would have the, the drying saline lakes issue. Whether these birds are able to move to other lakes or whether they we could have loss of of uh, productivity of, of particular waterfowl in the west. Liz Bowen was one of my students and I was working with a lot with contaminants. She was working with one of my colleagues, Jeff Stott at UC Davis, who had been applying gene transcription to uh, agricultural applications, cattle, and trying to determine whether we could look at gene transcription as a way of determining the health of the animal. Liz Bowen got interested in this and then I got interested in it because we were just measuring levels of contaminants, but not really knowing, except for the work that we did at Protuxent, what the exact factor was have, effect it was having on an animal. With Liz Bowen's work, we were able to see actual change in an animal. For example, an animal exposed to polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons would have an, an uptick in an immune response to that. And it, it may not be deadly, but it could affect the, the health of the animal because the immune system is the most expensive in your body. And when your body is fighting one set of problems, it's, it's, it's losing ground in, in another part of the body. And so what we did was apply this to sea otters, uh, Exxon Valdez. We were able to show 
transcription up till about 2010. And when was Exxon Valdez? I can't even remember, was it eight? Yeah. Yeah, we were able to show reaction to PAHs in sea otters in Prince William Sound all the way up to about 2008, 2010. Then it started to, it started to level out. The system stopped, stopped responding to, to PAHs. And then we could tell the governments, okay, now it's clean. And that, that made Exxon very happy because they were having to pay, made some people a little bit sad because they were getting some pay from Exxon because of the damage done by it. But we, we were able to track that. With, um, oops, did I go too far? Okay. Um, I was surprised that, that Todd Eske sent this one because he's one of our premier desert tortoise ecologists. And desert tortoise are an iconic species in the Southwest. And because of, of drought conditions, increased, um, increased invasions by invasive species, fires in the desert, their populations have been in, in, in poor shape. It, uh, in addition to that, uh, off-road vehicles have been a huge problem in the, in the desert for, for desert tortoise. But I was surprised, he's, he's also, uh, he's a botanist by trade, but he's done all this work on, on desert tortoise. And he has, he actually started looking at distribution and abundance of Joshua trees and health of Joshua trees using Google Maps, by going online, Google Earth, not Google Maps, Google Earth. And then someone, someone realized what he was doing. He got onto satellite telemetry. What this has resulted in actually is him being able to show the distribution of, of two major populations of Joshua trees in the Southwest and their potential for, for increasing or the, the impacts on decreasing that population. Right now, things are kind of in a, a, an unknown state. They, were, they were actually were Joshua tree was supposed to be uh, listed. They had to back off on it because they're really not sure, given climate conditions, whether it's going to happen or not. But but the, the courts aren't ready to make that leap to to list them at this point. I, there's there's arguments about what climate model is actually uh, the best one to use. So, uh, Leslie DeFalco, I, I'm not sure if anyone's heard of, of Common Gardens, but what she has been doing is experimenting in arid conditions. Because plants in the desert go through life cycles of 20, 30 years before they really become mature. And, and with increasing climate change temperatures in the desert, she's been experimenting with plants that are more resilient, uh, given the, the increasing warming, uh, lower precipitation uh, con conditions. And so she's, she's very well renowned for, for doing this kind of work. She's, uh, heavily used by Bureau of Land Management because, uh, well, the point I did want to make though, invasive species have become a huge issue in the desert. And so you're getting in uh, grasses that are, that are, of course, catching fire. You're getting more intense again, more frequent fires. It's affecting these plants and she's working with plants to determine which one's the best fit for what situation in, in the Southwest deserts. Uh, Brian Halstead, um, is well, well, well known for his work on amphibians and herps. Uh, one uh, anecdotal issue that he works on is the, the giant garter snake in the Central Valley of California, where you have uh, rice agriculture as being a huge issue. He has worked with rice farmers in order to help this, this species, which is in, in a critical state, not, not, I think it's threatened, but not endangered. I could be I could be wrong on that. I have to look that up. But in any event, he's worked with rice farmers to help help preserve preserve this animal. And Bob Cowan mentioned garter snakes the other day. The giant garter snake grows to about uh, four feet long compared to maybe what you used to. Actually, two is it two meters, Mary? I can't remember what it is. Six feet, six feet. So it's quite a, quite a much larger garter snake than what you would see in your backyard here. Uh, he's worked with multiple species, uh, the mountain yellow-legged frog, uh, the slender salamander, and he also works with, with bats. But again, our big, big issue, a big selling point of our, our lab is conservation work on, on endangered species. Uh, John Keeley, world-renowned for working fire, wildfire, and chaparral. 
um, can't say, say enough about his work in terms of he's constantly called on in Southern California because of, of issues with chaparral. What he's showing is that there's type conversion happening because of invasive species and wildfire that the plant life is starting to switch more to plants that will burn more frequently and more intensely. And so there needs to be management action to, to stop that. Uh, as I, I mentioned this already, uh, this is Amy Vandergast's work. But I, again, my whole point is, is focusing on the people that do the work. And she's the one that developed this, this genetics toolbox. In this case, I think this is where you would be looking at a map of Southern California with the reds and yellows being places that resource management wants to concentrate on for 18 different species in this case. So she's, she provides information to fish and wildlife and to land managers. The Southern California Council of Governments is extremely and are uh, involved with this type of work. They put millions of dollars into species conservation in Southern California. It all happened because of all the massive roadways in Southern California and the people decided they, they wanted to have a tax to help pay for this kind of stuff, knowing where they need to preserve species for future development. So, uh, Josh, Josh Adams over in the corner does quite a lot of work on siting of wind energy. So the work that, that's going on in southern, southeast, southwestern Oregon now, they, uh, there's efforts to put in a wind farm. His work is determining where seabirds are most concentrated, where they use mostly oceanic habitat, and where siting. So Bureau of Ocean and Energy Management is, has been funding him for at least two decades to look at where is the best place to site. And this, this information is being used by courts to approve leases before DOI can actually even move forward with them. Pete Coates is our uh, sage grouse ecologist. Um, the Great Basin work, sage grouse are an iconic species, also threatened by particularly invasive species and wildfire. And so what he has developed is what's called a targeted early warning system in which the state biologists go out and collect different information. They feed it into a model and they can determine how their population is doing. And he's developed this modeling system. And this, a lot of these things that I'm talking about are online user-friendly uh, uh, applications that people can, can use, not only for these species, but for, for multiple species. Okay, so see now, it's a jump ahead again. All right, so now, what's my time? Am I doing good? Okay, great. Um, so now I just wanted to give you an overview. I, I had actually done a, a can talk on my lab um, and decided not to use it on Tuesday night. And I contacted these guys and said, send me a slide that shows me what you do in a, in a sound bite so I can, I can give a, the audience an, an idea of the diversity of work at the Western Ecological Research Center. Um, as I said, I'm their advocate and I think they do incredible work there, that's kind of proved in the fact that their proposals are, are, are very successful. Um, they, they put out 70 to 90 publications a year, 21 people. Um, and that's a, fairly, that's, a, that's a fairly robust record. So I, I can't say enough about how, you know, how proud I am of that group. And that's why I wanted to use the first half of my talk about that. And then the second half of the talk is talking about something that I have a little bit more familiarity with as a, a researcher, um, I wasn't directly a sea otter biologist, but I was a habitat biologist and I was a contaminants biologist working in these marine systems. And so um, Julie Yi took over for Tim Tinker. I highlighted three people in this slide. Julie Yi took over for Tim Tinker. Tim Tinker was mentored by Jim Estes. Uh, Jim Estes is one of my, my dearest friends. He is uh, world renowned for his work on marine systems and sea otters. Um, Jim suffered a, a major uh, accident a couple of years back, and he is, he is probably not going to recover fully to who he was. Um, and so, you know, every time I, th I talk about this, I always have to remember Jim because none of us would have been in a position, none of the people in this article that we put out which was a very important piece of work, would be in our place if it wasn't for, for, for Jim Estes. So um, 
I just wanted to, to, to shout that out. But Julie, Tim decided uh, he wanted to be close to the family. He's a Canadian, Nova Scotia. He took off. And I, it broke my heart, but I fully embraced what, what he, that he would step away from such a job because none of my PIs are going to go anywhere. They're all going to die in that position. I can tell you that right now. Um, even when there are a couple that I'm trying to get to move over a little bit or get someone younger in to help them get their legacy, continuation of their legacy. Uh, but Tim made this decision. Fortunately, he had always been working with Julie Yee because Julie and Tim were, were Bayesian nuts, Bayesian modeling nuts. And so a lot of their, their building of their expertise, they bounced off of each other. Julie was our center statistician. Um, I, and she was always very quiet, very intense, but I always knew she had a certain power about her. And bringing her in helped save this legacy of Jim Estes data that we've been collecting for 40, 50 years, and that we won't lose any, any ground on being able to analyze and interpret that data. And I think this article is very telling of that because the story starts in, in the Aleutians in, I think, in the 90s. And I was working with Jim. There were base closures going on in the Aleutians, uh, military base closures. One of the biggest issues was what was the impact of contaminants in those systems? Uh, before we close this base, what's, what's, what effect is that having on ecological systems? Well, Jim was very up on this and he said, yeah, you know, this, this, is, this is important. It could be affecting sea otters. In the 90s, he's, we started recognizing sea otters started, the, the population started to decline. And he was like, um, well, wow, it's got to be contaminants or something like this. I started diving with Jim in 1979 as a, as a technician. I was actually starting with my PhD, but I was his technician uh, at ATSU. We circumvented, circumvented, we went around ATSU in a 17 foot whaler in 79. And if you know, I don't know how, how long is that to 30 miles, 40 miles long in a, in a little 17, two guys, and we should have died. We, we, we didn't. Um, but at that time, we must have counted 50,000 sea lions. A few years later, Jim called me and said, we went around, no, not a few years later, I was at Patuxent. It was in the late 80s. Jim called me and said, we went around that too. We could hardly find any sea lions maybe we saw 5,000 animals. He says, I don't know what the heck's going on up there, but it, it's, this is really strange. So then we got into the base closure work. Uh, military was paying a lot of money to figure out where, how things were doing. I got called into this because I was a contaminants biologist at Protoxin. Went up with Jim. We spent a lot of time collecting a lot of samples in the Aleutians, uh, both looking at nutritional, uh, whether the foods at the Aleutians were in good shape for, for animals around military bases. But Jim started noticing more and more the sea otters were starting to disappear. And we were sitting, and I'll just show you real quickly. This was, this was kind of my contribution to that work. Uh, Organochlorines like PCBs and DDTs were still prevalent in the system, legacy contaminants that took uh, decades to, to dissipate to a point where they would stop having an effect. We did a lot of work on DDT PCBs at Protection Wildlife Research Center, particularly on birds. So we knew what the thresholds were for wh what the levels in the system would have on birds. So just to give you some ideas, of, so we looked at fish. And these, uh, these were four very common uh, fish in the system around the, around the Aleutian Islands. And this just shows you PCBs in East ADAC being much higher, uh, ADAC was a military base, Navy base for decades, uh, pre-World pre War II. For those that don't know, the Aleutians were the only US territory invaded by the Japanese. They, had, uh, they took over Attu and they bombed, uh, and they took over Kiska Island in the Western Aleutians. Congress decided, can't have Japanese on, the, on our US soils. They sent a military, bunch of military up there carrying um, radar equipment, which used PCB lubricant. Um, DDT, they thought 
we're going out into the Aleutians, there's going to be mosquitoes and everything. What all this DD in, in barrels got up and say, oh, there's no mosquitoes in the Aleutians. They dumped the barrels out into the tundra. We found, we found 55 gallon barrels still intact in the tundra on ADAC. So um, in any event, what I was able to demonstrate is that, of course, in, in fish, at military installations, and Chitka was where was the site of an underground nuclear testing. Uh, I think that happened in the 60s. It set off a couple of nuclear bombs. That was why Jim Estes actually got wound up in the Aleutians. He was got a big military contract. His, his major professor, Norm Smith, who was an old friend, um, said, hey, I got a bunch of military money. You should go up to Aleutian and see what that, uh, all that radioactivity is doing to the sea otters. Uh, he got up there and he said, well, I don't... I don't see nobody's nobody's glowing, no, no one's belly up. And he invited a colleague of ours, a colleague of his. I was a graduate student at that time. Um, I, I mean, I was a kid at that time. Uh, he invited Bob Payne up from the University of Washington. And Bob came up and said, I don't think you're gonna find anything with radioactivity. Take a look at look at this marine environment. What's the heck's going on in this marine environment? And that's what sent Jim on his trajectory of being able to look at uh, ecosystem, classic ecosystems of kelp forests, urchins, urchin barrens, otters, eat urchins, kelp flourishes. This whole trajectory was caused by a man just saying, mentoring Jim, saying, why don't you look at? And that's what Jim focused on. That's why I keep bringing up those scientists in the group, mentor, mentor, mentor because you're, you're creating information that needs to be carried on. And if you break it and it's lost, then that goes in the toilet. And then we got to start all over again. Some new graduates who come along and say, I got a great idea. I and mean, you didn't pass that information on. So PCBs uh, in blue mussels, again, Amchitka, ADAC, Thai, the other islands, Kiska was uh, the site of where the Japanese were. There were some, some things there that showed a blip in contaminants, but not much. But this was a real telling slide. Where that red is, is where the Navy base is. And if you look at the concentrations of PCBs and, and mussels, how it dissipates from that spot. And that was a, an evening chat that I was having with Jim in the late 90s. And he says, I, he says after oh, three, almost, three decades of studying artists, I don't know what the heck is going on in the illusions, um, why these artists are disappearing. And that sent him, he started calling, he collaborated, called it all his buddies. Let's look at nutrition. Let's look at contaminants. Let's look at disease. Let's look at um, body condition. We went through all of this. And, it, and then working with his spouse, Terry Williams, who was a physiologist, they determined how many otters would a killer whale have to eat in order to sustain. And while I was in the Aleutians, I actually saw a killer whale per day or, or, uh, eat a sea otter. And that was just kind of like, wow, that was kind of, that was interesting to see that. That's what led up to that major article is that what Jim, what Jim hypothesized is that great whaling went on in the Pacific, North Pacific, up until the mid 70s. Um, that caused a decadal effect on killer whales who needed to feed on the great whales, that the population had been uh, depressed enough that first the killer whales started eating sea lions. And when he saw this big loss of sea lions in the, in, on Adak Island, and then eventually then started seeing sea otters decline down to numbers in the thousands, you know, 50, 60,000 animals, counting some places that were down in, the, in just in the thousands that he realized that he came up with the hypothesis. So we tested everything you could imagine to try to figure out if there was any other reason for why sea otters had disappeared in the Aleutians. And we think we hit, we think Jim hit, hit it on the head. We were along for the ride, and it was it was a it was a fun ride. And again, I again I looked at multiple things, but birds. If you if you look at even birds in the Aleutians, how much lower they are than the Canadian Arctic gulls, fumars, 
puffins weren't uh, weren't in weren't in the uh, Canadian Arctic. But in any event, the levels that we were seeing in birds was so low that we just said there's there's just not enough here to say that this is an effect of contaminants in that system. So then I. I'm, I'm putting together a story uh, from the Aleutians that made me start thinking of back when Bob Cowan and I were graduate students doing our work on San Nicolas Island. We started working there in about 1980. I did a study in which I was looking at the structure of the benthic community. Pateria, which is a bat star, was on my sites in such density that on, a, on a, a control site, it was about three animals per meter square. On my experimental sites where I cleared, because of what I was trying to do was determine succession in the, in the bottom community of a kelp forest. So I cleared these sites and of course it's tracked it in bacteria like, like mice because on a cleared surface, you have things settling and growing. And so it was a great place for an animal like a, a bat star to come and just start feeding along that. I had I could have get twelve of those in a meter square area. I started that experiment in a, in the middle of nineteen, or I think early or mid nineteen eighty. I ran it for eighteen months, um, just looking at succession. But what I started noticing is that bacteria started having a little whitish look to it, and I said, "Wow, what's going on here?" And then if I looked at I went pull my thesis out from way back then, I looked at it this week. And what I saw was bacteria went like that, and then all of a sudden it went boom. And I'm thinking, huh, that kind of chives with what, what, we, what I started observing. But I wasn't studying bacteria. I was studying plants and things that affected plants and maybe some sessile things, but not so much something. Bacteria was too fast crawling for me, for, for starfish in the work I was doing but it has started disappearing. And I mentioned it to, was it John Pierce was a professor at, who actually looked at disease. He sent a graduate student out um, and we always still chuckle about this graduate student because he, he was one of the study Pachythione, which was a little cucumber. And he loaded up a bunch in a pool and he put a couple of telia anemones in there with it. And by the time he drove back to Santa Cruz, all of his Pachythione were gone, telia ate them all. You know, they just claw around and claw, and then, then we grab it and eat it. And so, and he, and, and I think he had a difficult time after that getting his degree, but because he just couldn't, but John didn't really pay any attention. Um, but I started noticing this, but I was too much of a graduate student. My head, I had my head in the, in the bottom. I wasn't really thinking about what was happening. Then the, First, the, the, the sea stars and the um, urchins then started losing their spines, whitish on the spines. Cucumbers started disappearing. Pachythione in a meter area would be hundreds of them in a meter square. They, they, they were disappearing. Well, what did we do in 1988? We decided San Nicolas Island is a great, great place to move sea otter. Yay, everybody, yay. So we, we loaded up. I had some slides actually sent. We have, I have pictures of us in uh, lines of uh, dog, dog carriers with, with otters in it. And we flew from, from um, Monterey, from the aquarium, up to San, uh, out to San Nicolas Island and dropped otters in there. And I was part of that in 1988, helping unload these otters into the environment. During that same time, the gastropods, Abalone, Astraea, uh, what's the common name for Astraea? It's kind of a turban, big, big turban snail. They started, uh, I would be looking around, and they're flopping with, a, with their uh, muscle just hanging out from under the shell. And they started with a wasting disease. The abs started disappearing. So now, one thing that I think may have happened in that system is that disease either because of the ecosystem was or the ecology of the system was in a state of it had gotten too big too many animals in a in a small area it, it facilitated the spread of disease i don't know 
but something like that may have happened. It could have been El Nino, warming conditions that helped precipitate this. But the reality is, had I known, I could have spoken up because I was still pretty green then and said, maybe we had to wait, but we dropped orders in there. And for, from 88 to about 2015, 2014, something, they did nothing. Some book back to the coast, there was nothing wrong with the one, the few animals that were having young. It was not really, you know, it wasn't an issue of that, that there seemed to be a problem with their reproduction. They just weren't interested. And I think the system was in a low state. Robert May and his um, uh, ecosystem stability, it was in a low state. And maybe we shouldn't have moved otters then. Maybe we should have waited 15 years. But they're doing a lot better now. They stayed at 30, 40 animals for 15 years. Then all of a sudden, they've, they've started taking off. They've got probably three, three I I'd have to ask the, the California Fish and Game guys, Fish and Wildlife, sorry guys, um, wildlife guys, uh, what their counts are, or, or some of our USGS people, I'm not, I'm not even sure, but, but, it, but they're starting to take off. In it. And the system is back. I, I dived at it last fall. Pachythione is all over the bottom. You can look down in crevices and see, see abalone. So we're back into a better state of the system. So that's one, one observation. And we have the data that I can go back. This is my thesis, which was okay. But we have the USGS has 40 years of data from, that, from San Nicolas Island. I can go back now and look through that data and see whether my hypothesis of what happened on San Nicolas Island holds. So now I go back, now I'm jumping back to Port Orford. I was a technician working for Ron Jameson, um, who worked for Jim Estes. And Ron and I dove Port Orford. This was four years after the reintroduction of otters to Port Orford that they brought down, I think two, two years in a row, they brought down a bunch of otters in the C-130, I can't remember the numbers, and they dumped them in. Well, there was a big mistake in that, in that first translocation. They moved the otters dry and in, in kennels. I don't know if they used dog kennels, if they were even in existence back then, but they moved them dry in pens and sea otters have to stay clean in order to, to uh, maintain their body heat because they're, they have the most luxurious fur of any animal on earth, a uh, thousand hairs per square centimeter of their, a um, hundred thousand, I'm sorry, hairs per, per 2.5 centimeters of area of their body, 100,000 hairs, have to maintain absolute clean. They, they don't have any blubber layer. They, may, they stay warm by keeping air up under all that thick fur, and that creates insulation for them. They, they brought them down dry and dirty. They let them go. The otters wouldn't run to the water. They started running back. The biologists chased them into the water. So a lot of them died from hypothermia. Um, but, and, and there is some supposition that some moved to up north and helped build a population off of Cape Alava in Washington, because I, I'm not sure whether that was a translocation site, but all of a sudden, years later, Ron talked about that population has mysteriously grown. And so they think maybe those artists may have booked north. And when we moved artists to San Nicolas, uh, I don't know how far San Nicholas is from, from Monterey. Uh, I don't know what's airline distance. How much? 300, 300 miles. The sea otter had made it back by the next day. One of the marked artists was back, back at his pen ready to be fed. So, so they can move, they can book a, a long distance. So, so I dove with Ron in, in Port Orford. And guess what I saw? There was a blade of kelp on the, on, the, on the bottom. Maybe a couple of little plants here and there, but I found a, we found a mound of purple lurchins. And I mean, that mound was about that high on the bottom. And I thought they were mounded up on a, just over a piece of substrate. Started knocking the urchins off. They were feeding on, a, on, a, on an octopus, a dead octopus. They were starving. 
the state of Port Orford, it was an urchin bar. It was in a, it was in a bad state. Did they move? Did the, they move artists first? They moved them wrong. Did they not dive and look at the area first and make some kind of a habitat assessment to to ascertain whether these artists could actually make it there through a winter? Because you can get a thousand urchins on the bottom in an urchin barn, but you break it open and they're vestigial. They're they're gonads. There's nothing. It's a string. Looks like string. Whereas a healthy urchin has very robust egg masses. And that's what the otters are after. They wouldn't even go after these things because there was nothing there for them to eat. So that's, that's my, my, my lessons learned. Not only do we know, need to know what we're doing, we need to know when we're doing it. And if you want to have a, a, a good chance of a translocation, the translocations, or I have to use, I think the word is reintroduction now. Um, but animals were moved from Monterey Bay Aquarium into Elkhorn Slough. That population's done great. That's the same one of the reasons why we knew that, that uh, otters weren't um, suffering disease or, or contaminants in the Aleutians because there were places like, I'm not going to remember the harbor. Cove um, on ADAC, but there was a population in there, numbers never changed. They were doing just fine because killer whales couldn't get across the sandbar to get to them. So there were little nuances like that that were telling us that there wasn't something that was just wiping out all the, all the otters like, like disease. So the, so the lesson of this is that we have to do our homework. We've been doing this a long time. Long-term research is critical to making wise decisions about conservations of, conservation of animals. And we can't do it with a graduate thesis. Those that are in graduate school don't think that you're done because you got, you got decades before you start coming up with ideas. And I'm no Jim Estes. A lot of us aren't going to Jim Estes, but there are Jim Estes and, and San Lu Omas, and those, those are really gifted people. But for the most part, we have, to, we have to slog through this for 20, 30 years before we start even beginning to figure it out. So for, for translocating animals to, this, to Southwest Oregon coast, there's one other, one other caveat that needs to be considered. And this was Tim Tinker's work. He showed, he has shown very well, um, very solidly, that the reasons that the populations of, of otters on the California coast probably aren't gonna to grow too much larger. They will grow larger as they could expand north, but they aren't gonna grow it exponentially because the, the habitat is linear. It's straight, there's nowhere except for Elkhorn Slough where you can get a bunch of animals in it, tucked back in there and protected. Maybe they'll get into San Francisco Bay um, and, and get protected even though they could get run over by ferries and they gotta deal with pollution and sailboats and everything else. But they could expand there, numbers there, but it's only in protected habitats that they that that really the California coast doesn't have a lot of. That's why the, the animals up in the southeast Sitka areas did so well. Their populations expanded, but same reproductive rate as California. But they went up, you know, from from post uh, hunting when the Russians enslaved the Aleuts to kill all the otters on the on the Pacific East, Pacific East um, they, they were able to really expand and explode back in numbers, 35, 40,000 animals. We're not gonna see, we're not gonna see that kind of growth uh, on the California coast because it's just linear. It's all a spatial relationship. So that's one of the things that we have to be kind of aware of. Are they, these animals gonna be able to, uh, to escape a pod of killer whales that come along and decide lunch. Um, should we be using California animals? Or should we go back to using Alaska animals? We use Alaska animals, are they going to book north? But what's the big difference between California animals and Alaska animals? In Alaska, you go, on a, you go up, a, up a shoreline, you see a sea otter sitting up on shore, kicking back. California otters don't climb out. So, Alaska otters have a little bit of an advantage. They can climb out and escape predation because that's what they can do. You can't get a California otter 
to do anything but climb on a, on a, uh, recently in Monterey Bay, climbing on someone's surfboard, chasing him off the surfboard. They're catching him today. Actually, that's just one artist. And this one artist's mother did the same kind of behavior. So it's somehow, it's, a, it's, a, it's genetic. Um, but basically, they're either going to climb on your boat, but they're not going to run up on shore. And, and it's rare that you get, get one that climb, climbs up on a boat. Uh, the, the, and, and, the, and the Monterey artists are the most domesticated you can imagine. Um, so there are all these nuances that we have to take into consideration. We have to proceed with the best information, the best science possible to make that decision. And even then, it's just, it's not guaranteed. I'm not, I'm all for let's making sure that, the, that we, we do conservation. And if reintroduction is a, is, the, is a good way of doing this, I'm all for it. But let's just do it, at least say, we gave it our best shot. We gave it the opportunity to, to sustain. So that's my message. Um, and I, I'm open for any questions. Oh, I'm sorry. I have a little, I have a little uh, uh, show for you. And this is just extra because people, what people don't realize is that the other part of this is, maybe you can help me. Um, the other part of this is, it, it, it ain't easy catching a sea otter either. And so I, I was part of a capture group. I actually, I actually ran around underwater, but I was not very good. Uh, people like Colleen Young with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and Jim Bodkin and Dan, Dan Munson uh, with USGS, Joe Tomaglione, these guys, uh, Ben Weitzman, these are the people who really knew what they were doing and knew how to do it. But this is, this is kind of a, an interesting show of what, it's, what it takes to catch a sea otter. So they're signaling underwater about which direction they have to go in, how far they have to go. So he gave them a five by five, meaning let's go 10, 10, 10 beats and stop. They're wearing, wearing rebreathers re because otters can smell your bubbles. So if you're wearing regular scuba and bubbles are coming up, they can smell your breath and they know that they'll book right away. So we have to wear rebreathers and then the, using these uh, powered scooters, and then trying to find an otter on the surface is another problem. Pardon? Yes, it's a basket, and it has a it has a, a pull line on it. And you pull a line when you when you capture the otter. But look, so he sees one. He's pointing. And it takes this whole process takes about 20, 25 minutes or so. They're still looking. They, they thought they saw one. So these guys have been doing this for decades, and they still, it's, it's, it's just difficult. You hear him? Ooh, takes a lot of strength. Okay, so this is the perspective from their their perspective. And the same, there was a cameraman on shore who were able to see the other perspective. And you, there were some bubbles escaping. You can see they're a little alert, kind of suspecting something because they smell something.
that's where you come in and you tie the otter off, uh, making sure it doesn't bite a hole in the side of the, the raft. Um, and after you do that, you have to help the divers on board. You can check on the auto to make sure it doesn't bite a hole in the boat. Because we're out of the middle of nowhere. And then getting the auto from the net into the auto box. Um, this is mostly a uh, uh, method data, but also what helps help that assessment. And we tag them so we can determine their movement. That's Jim Bodkin. Wanted to give you an idea what it, what it takes. It's not it's not a minor operation. So I just wanted to, to show a little bit of fun fun ending to this. Um, but it's it's what you have to look forward to if we do do reintroductions in South Southwest Washington. Very specialized group. That's the other thing. When you talk about passing on legacy, all of us now are in our 60s. We're doing these captures. Some of us are in our 70s. Um, I saw Bob look at me. Uh, anyway. Um, and we we haven't really we haven't really uh, we haven't trained up. We're getting we're getting there, but having this kind of expertise takes dozens dozens of dives by a, a skilled skilled diver, and maybe you know into the hundreds before we can really trust that once an animal is captured, it won't be harmed in the, in the process of the capture. So thank you very much. Questions? Right here? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I really appreciate what you're saying about having decades of research and kind of um, don't just shoot in the dark because you found some some piece of something. But with that said, do you have now a checklist that you go through for uh, prior to relocation, based on this kind of research, you know, like, uh, are there killer whales around, or you know, is the healthy use urchin population as a chemical free, um, that kind of thing, uh, uh, before relocation happens now, so that you can, you know, sort of plow the field, so to speak, for a farming analogy, or you know, yeah, make sure I, that they'll take. 
Yeah, that's a good that's a good question. It, you know, I I I'm fortunately do science, and and USGS is always accused of you guys won't won't give your opinion on anything. Um, our checklist is mainly looking at the at whether it's a it's a good idea based on what we know of the habitat. Um, that's what we're moving toward. I still have to dig through this data and prove my hypothesis for San Nicolas Island. Um, we won't. I, we don't have the data to prove for for Port Orford for the first time around. So this is why I bring this up: is that this needs to be brought into consideration. It's it's up to the natural resource agencies to determine based on the best information available whether whether a, a reintroduction should occur. It's too hard. It's very hard to measure things like where a killer whale population will be at a given time. It's it's unlikely that we'll see a repeat of what happened in the Aleutians because the gray whale population has recovered so well on the California coast. Otters taking, I mean, killer whales taking otters was scraping the bottom of the barrel. And the, and the barrel is full now, it's refilled. We The, the Marine Mammal Protection Acts that uh, were brought into play after the demise of the great whales, those populations have recovered very well. I doubt that we would ever see killer whale predation to that nature, other than maybe a cat playing with a mouse kind of thing. So I, I think those years are, are well beyond us. It's a great lesson for humanity, though. Don't go back to, to whaling as a way of life. Um, contaminants, most, most coastal uh, state coastal agencies have a very robust testing for water quality. So what we were dealing with were legacy contaminants and the military, the military got away with murder. You know, they, they had a job to do and a war to fight. But a lot of, a lot of uh, barrels of PCBs and DDT were left in the Aleutians. And they were, they were tasked millions, hundreds of millions of dollars cleaning that up. So we don't have that problem. Uh, Oregon, California, Washington are very strict about what goes into the water system now. So we don't have to worry about that. I do think that taking care to make sure you're in an up, upswing of the of the uh, of the quality of the environment is still a, a wise choice. But with climate change, who knows what our future looks like? Um, we only can make our make our best. It's almost like a best guess. Uh, and I'm not exactly sure how that's going to play out, um, but I don't think that those are real solid reasons for not going through with a, a reintroduction. I just think it's just moving cautiously. And given the animals, it took 25, 88, it took almost 20 years before the animals started to do anything at San Nicolas. Maybe that's the way it's going to have to play out. But I think that we could have probably, if we had done it on an upswing of the of the quality of the environment, then, then it probably would have taken a lot, a lot sooner. Thanks, Keith. I'm going to put you on the spot just a little bit because I'm trying to square what you're reporting in terms of what you saw down in Southern Oregon at the reintroduction sites with what Ron Jameson reports in his thesis and in his publications. Because in there, he describes all the dive surveys he did in that area, not before the reintroduction, but you know, right after and describes it being good to excellent habitat with sufficient prey resources. And he describes the great numbers of urchins that he observed in that areas and all the other prey as well. So well, try like this. <laughs> I'll have to square that with, was he exactly right? He saw lots of urchins and in our, in our estimation at that time, lots of urchins meant lots of good food. So he wasn't really looking at kelp quality that, that the environment, the entire environment. He was counting urchins, wow, great number of urchins, great number of invertebrates. But when you break these animals open, because we have urchin barrens in San Nicolas Island, there is nothing in them. And otters just are, can't make it on that. So it, 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 it will, I have offered and Jim Botkin and I and others, let's go take a look and see what we see before we do the do a reintroduction, just to know that you, your your timing is right, to 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 help maximize because we just we want to 
we've had one experience where did these animals move north or did they all die? We really don't know for certain. So let's just make sure we got all the best information prior to the reintroduction. And I don't even know how cyclic that system is. How long does it take to go through? We see urchin barons come and go at San Nicolas Island. So uh, it, it, what's the diversity of habitat? Maybe what we did in the Channel Islands back in the 80s, we went through the entire, we, we didn't stop just at Fort Orford. We went north and south uh, or east and west, whatever in the Channel Islands. We went all over and said, if otters get, get reestablished, are they gonna have places to move to? When the, when the quality of habitats are low, is it gonna be high in other places? So I just, I just recommend making good assessments of the habitat before you just drop otters. That's just, that's in my opinion. I mean, I, I, I believe they did actually collect urchins and weigh them and look at the, the mass, but um, we can let that know. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I haven't talked to Ron in, in quite some time and I, I have to, we'd have to chat about that. But we, we were just amazed by, by the, how this reflected later on in Diving with Jim and the Aleutians that, hey, hmm, that looks pretty, pretty familiar. Yeah, I'm going to field one question um, from online. Chanel Hasten from the Ilaka Alliance asks if the capture footage is available for public usage somewhere. Uh, I can make it available if they want to. If uh, I can make a copy of it, that was my own personal data uh, filming. She can, um, if you want to give her my, oh, you know, one of the things. And advance this. Oh, that's just a, a slide of not a bite on uh, Joe Tomlin's arm through through a Kevlar patch <laughs> in one of our. Um, this is my. Uh, this is a a link to our our center's website, and she can get in touch with me through that, and I can send her that that footage. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, during when you talked about releasing the sea otters during an El Nino when the environment was in a downswing, you mentioned that you could have said something, but that you were a grad student and like you were green. Um, a lot of us interns are possible grad students to be, and we were. And I was curious: um, is that like a common thing with grad students? Is it like, do you have any advice, um, kind of in that area? I just, I guess I just kind of wanted your take. Um, I think I. I I think my advice is similar to what Jane, Jane Blutinchko and Jim Essies were advisors on my committee. And um, Jane always said, take a step back. Don't always have your head buried down into so focused on what your research question is. Take time to learn about the natural system in which you're, you're working. We're so quick to just gather numbers gather data as much as we can without really understanding what that data means during the time we're gathering. And sometimes though, it'll take, it'll take a long time. Just make sure you have very robust, well-designed studies to make sure the information that you produce is solid. Um, but understand that you, you know, hearing Jim Estes after 25 years of, of being at this, uh, maybe more than that, a little bit longer than that to sit there and look blankly and say, I don't know what the hell is going on before we started working on this, this long-term um, project. So don't, don't despair. But the other things that I, that I really recommend is make sure you, you de develop good collaborations, have lots of people you talk to. Don't, don't operate in a vacuum. Um, the, the professors are there to mentor. They're not supposed to be just teaching, they're supposed to be mentoring and passing on this type of information to you. Um, choose your friends well. You don't get to choose family, you're stuck with them. But you get to choose your friends and choose friends that give you all the kind of encouragement and who wanna hear what you have to say because those are the ones that are gonna provide you with the advice that makes you really wanna push on. So, 
And I think my other advice is uh, get a get a dog that walks you. Don't get a dog you have to walk. <laughs> All right. Uh, any more questions online? No. All right. Thank you, uh, everyone. Please join me in thanking Keith Miles for joining us today. <laughs>